rebuilding. A catastrophic failure, a new start, physically, mentally. Hey guys, and welcome to the Silverback Blueprint Podcast. Today, we've got a super exciting guest. We have Josh Bryant with us. We're actually doing this in video, so you're going to get a chance to see two really good looking guys, what it looks like with a beard and without a beard, but this is what man looks like, so it's pretty awesome. And uh, Josh, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Kurt. I appreciate it. Awesome, man. Um, so tell us a bit about Josh Bryant. I mean, I think you were the, one of the youngest guys to ever bench 600 pounds. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. That obviously caught my attention. Uh, but I know that, you know, you're a strength coach. You do a lot of cool things. But maybe just a little bit of, you know, Josh Bryant, nine years old, got pushed around, got angry, decided to pick up gotcha. weights. Like, how did all that go? A what, what, little, little bit of background on you, brother. Okay, so basically what I did is I um, was obsessed with pro wrestling as a kid. So I started watching it all the time, and uh, I wanted to get a physique like the people on it. So five years old, my dad had a universal-type machine out in the garage. I'd go out there and mess around with it. Then I'd try to sneak in the Y weight room when he'd go play racquetball. And then about 12 years old, I got serious, and actually he let me start lifting seriously. Then I had a powerlifter named Steve Hall, took me under his wing, kind of showed me how to do things the right way. And I uh, fell in love with it and kind of been at it ever since in one way or another. And um, what I did is I um, kind of went around the, basically a little bit more about my background as I got, I was into more regular sports, you know, football, track, boxing, things like that. Then I decided after playing college football, I wanted to focus primarily on strength. So what I did is I had a chance to move all around the United States and train with a lot of the strongest people in the world and learn from them. So what I did is I'd go, go move around like, you know, for deadlift, I moved down to Louisiana, train with Gary Frank, you know, things like that. So I've had a chance to go all over and train at all these different gyms and, and learn from the best people. Then after that, I went back, got my master's degree and kind of learned, you know, not, I've learned hands on what works than a lot of the why later. The so science kind of went behind in the reverse it order from most people. And since it, Exactly. The uh, interesting thing I liked is that the, so far that you said that intrigued me is that how you finally got serious at 12 because you'd been basically screwing around till 12 and you finally decided to get serious at 12. I mean, that's good. That's awesome. Most of us that happens much it. later, but that's yeah. pretty cool. Um, the other thing I really liked that I picked up on is um, how you basically started seeking out coaches or or mentors in the areas you wanted to improve so you just basically what, just jumped in the car and said hey Gary Frank's a bad motherfucker on the deadlift I'm going to go and hang out with him and learn is that basically what you did yeah so what I did is I was in college at the time so I said all right I'm just gonna check out LSU and enroll in school down there for a semester went down worked out with him headed back Wow. Pretty cool. So. Pretty cool. And you know what, at the end of the day, that's one of the biggest things that uh, we try to talk about just here on this podcast or just in life in general. If you want to get better at something, one of the fastest ways is to seek out, seek out someone who's doing it at a high level and learn from them. Yeah. So that's what basically exactly what I did is like, you know, just make those decisions, college jobs, all that stuff revolving at the time around what was going to benefit lifting because that was my focus. So I would, you know, attend schools went to a number of different colleges just for the purpose of training like i mean at that point there's no way in hell i would get a master's degree because i remember specific instances of like i am going to fail this test tomorrow i don't really care because if i don't get the proper amount of sleep my deadlift is gonna go crappy <laughs> i love it buddy i love it <laughs> what uh <laughs> I can just imagine that excuse to your professor as well. <laughs> but you know what? I mean, I get that. Obviously, I, what I, well, the other thing I'm picking up is that you were passionate at an early age and you realized that, you know, you wanted to go after it, yeah. which is fantastic. Um, one of the things, you know, that's interesting too, like, so you said you were in football. Now, did you like get injured in football and that pushed you more into the weight room? Because that's what happens to a lot of guys that got into power. No, like, not injured. Just Basically, what happened is I got um, – um, it, you know, a lot of the things we talk about, you know, what's a setback, what's a step forward, that kind of thing. I, I, a lot of the times can be a perspective because the time I didn't like it is I got, I got recruited to play fullback in college. And for what they had said they wanted, I was sort of the quintessential stereotypical fullback of, you know, guard in the backfield, you give the ball to get four or five yards, that type of thing, or okay. like a power blocker. But what they really wanted was more like 180, 90 pound tailback in the backfield for, for that particular offense. and um, so I switched things up. So I got switched to guard, which I actually did well at. So it wasn't like anything bad happened. It was just I didn't want to play guard. I wanted to play fullback. So 
Um, I didn't really like the fact that somebody else could uh, determine my fate regardless of ability because, you know, at the end of the day, the coach is making a decision where I can go into powerlifting and no one's going to tell me, you know, diddly, I'm just going to, I'm going to determine my own, you know, value and how good I am or not by what I do or not do. And at the end of the day, you have no one to answer to but yourself. And that's why I'm self-employed. That's why I'm a rugged individualist because uh, I don't really like, you know, institutions or anybody telling me what to do. I fucking love it. Cause you know what, one of the things that I think is super important is that we take control of our destiny one way or the other. If we're yeah. failing, it's because of us. And if we're succeeding, it's because of us, but it's to be able to have that control. And that's one of the same reasons why I became self-employed is I just, just the fact of being told what to do always rubbed me the wrong way. Even yeah. I mean, I was at a job, you know, before as a strength coach at a school and, and I, I just couldn't, no one did anything to me. I think I got special, I got treated better than most people that work there. No one ever did anything wrong to me. Like to the end of the day, you know, somebody that works there, like a principal or somebody's going to tell you, you know, like yeah. how to dress or something. It's like, get the hell out of here. I'm going to, if I want to show up in my underwear, that's what I'm going to do, you know? <laughs> Especially on deadlift day. Um, that's all right. <laughs> I, well, I think it's really cool that way too, is I think early on finding out how you're wired like that is super important because it makes it easier to make a lot of yeah. choices and stuff. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. It's not good or bad because some people are, are better in that kind of work structured environment. And if everybody was the way we are, the world wouldn't be good either because everybody would be, you know. Everybody would be telling everybody what to do and nobody would be doing it. Doing anything. So, yeah, so it works out good. What, um, so powerlifting, you know, all three lifts was always your thing? Or did you specialize? Like, I mean, we've talked a bit about your bench press. Well, but that's interesting about that because the first guy taught me how to lift. Oh, no, obviously I'd be better at bench pressing by um, just the way I'm built, but um, big chest, not real long arms, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I didn't have a, so what kind of happened was I always had pretty big arms, but I didn't have a big chest. So this guy that taught me, Steve Hall, really like hammered home a lot of, you know, direct chest work besides pressing. So my chest grew like crazy and um, I got really good at bench press and looking back on it, you know, he was like a, uh, six high sixes squats, high sixes deadlift, you know, 545, 550 bench at a time when people weren't benching that as much. So clearly he was like a bench specialist sort of that did all three lifts. That was like right, his right. strong point. And I trained with him. So I kind of, whether it was anatomy or, or environment or whatever, it's probably a combination of all that. That's initially why I went that direction. So I was doing both full meets power and bench press meets. Okay. Then I wanted to get better at all three lifts. So what I did is started seeking out people. Um, squatting was not natural for me. I wasn't one of those people who was good at it when I was young. Mm -hmm. I had to work real hard at it. Mm -hmm. Where um, bench pressing, I think it could have been pretty good. In my, I mean, not to be the youngest person bench press 600, obviously it's something right. But I think it could have been like a 500 pound bencher doing something stupid. You know, yeah, I was, you're, yeah, you just had some gifts with that period. Yeah, and, gifts yeah. of bench press. I would yeah. have been, you know, good no matter, even if I did something outrageous, I still would have been the strongest person at most gyms at least. Well, let's be honest. And, you know, in your, you know, your experience and even my experience, we've seen a lot of people that are strong despite their stupidity and stuff. Yeah, and I would have been one of those people on bench, but yeah. squat was not that way. I had to work pretty hard at it or real hard at it. And that wasn't – so what I did there is um, I didn't get a chance – or I didn't have a chance yet to work with anybody directly. So um, I got Ed Cohn's phone number and I just started calling him up all the time. And <laughs> for some reason, he actually, he actually took the calls, believe it or not. Which That's crazy. Eh? Well, I mean, I'm wondering, I, you're a little younger than me, but a lot of ours training for you for sure. And even for me started before the internet. Yeah. So he just started giving me like some workouts to do things like that. So like um, having better structured in the programming, because before I do like only heavy doubles and singles, my right. squats didn't work as well for me uh, doing that. So then he had me cycle back a bit and I, my squat finally started to come along. Now deadlift was the lift I was uh, not good at. You know, I had to work really hard at that. I had a number of people tell me that, you know, you're never going to pull 700 because well, you're built. So you're going to have to really have to work hard to get that up, to get to the 700. But right. I ended up pulling over 800 because that's the lift where, um, you know, what could be your, potentially your darkest moment in powerlifting and being, you know, not genetically set up for something become a strong suit because you're all of a sudden traveling all over the world or the United States to find answers from people. 
so a couple of things yeah. I like what I hear there is first off, someone told you you couldn't do it. So I'm I, just getting to know you already. That probably fired you up because other people told you you couldn't do something. Number two is that because it wasn't your best lift, you threw that much more effort behind it. That's the main thing. For me. I've never been one of those people that like, I know some people when they get, they quote unquote, like do something good. They're always like, or well, they'll always refer back in eighth grade. Somebody told me I couldn't do it. And like, here's the like Mr. Smith that told me this, you know, screw you. I'm not that type of person. Yeah, yeah. I've been more self-motivated of yeah. like, I'm just going to do this things. And, and um, even like uh, in boxing, like or some or, or football, you know, we're combative sports. It was never about necessarily beating the other person. I always did my best where I viewed the other person, not as like an enemy or a friend. They were like a silhouette and okay. I didn't, and I just, um, if I do what I have to do, like in boxing, if I do that silhouette, what I have to do is punch at that silhouette. There's no emotional involvement. I know this, if I hit the silhouette, then I can open up more and throw more wild punches because a silhouette can't defend itself as much. It's not like an emotional thing. It's just, I got to be tight, get the job done. And once, once that silhouette's been cracked and it's not as able to defend itself, then I go ape shit. And finish it. Well, but th I've, there's I've, no, I've... there's no emotional, like, I, I hate you or kill yeah, you yeah. Or, or I love you. It's just about, yeah. I got to focus on if I know if I extend my hips this way, playing linebacker, I know if you run at me and I get in the, they call it the Crowder technique of like where you get your hips fully extended into somebody. I know if I execute that you're done. And that's the way I roll. Not right. thinking, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess you up. It's more like I'm going to execute perfectly. So it was more like, you know, mutual respect before and after, but at the, during the game, it's business and it's get the job done. And, you know, it's not even respect either way. It's just get focus on what you got to do. And you're like, just against a silhouette. I love it. I love it. I, li I like it how, again, it's, you're internalizing it, so it still just comes down to you against you. Right? Yeah, exactly. For me at the best level possible that you can do. Awesome. Because awesome. I had the experience one time when I was boxing somebody, and um, it was a sparring match against an older guy when I was in eighth grade, and I should have beaten him pretty bad, and I didn't beat him till the end because mm -hmm. I wanted to kick his ass so bad that I was getting like, hur, hur, and and like, like not tied up and breathing yeah. heavy and stuff yeah. then yeah, yeah. Awesome. then this got one of those old guys just like hey just see how many times you can hit him so then at that point it relax because you want to you know hit him 10 times you can't be like throwing wild punches then the rest was like poetry in motion it's all about the focus and what you choose it to be right exactly i love it man i love it and um one of the other things too is uh what i like is that just your challenge based like you just you decide you're going to do something and you go after it and you do it absolutely yeah. And that's, that's the, that's the other thing too, right? That's the, that's the one thing that's totally within our control. doesn't matter how old we are, where we're at, we can decide on a momentary basis that we're in charge and it's up to us. So what can I do to deal with this right now? Yeah. It's, 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 it's sort of scary and liberating at the same time, because once you decide to take responsibility for your actions, it is scary because you are responsible at the same time, you know, even comes down to your thoughts. Like, like that's something I've learned in the last few years. You actually control your thoughts. Like, so if you're always envious, always jealous, always pissed off, that's no one's fault, but your own. The yeah. same time, if you're full of joy and happiness, that's your own fault too. So you, you can program that kind of stuff. Yep. Mindset. It's all mindset. Mindset. Right? Recognizing yeah. when it's not what it should be and adjusting it along the way. Right. Easier said Hell than yeah. first, right? Because a lot of times we're dealing with a lot of emotions behind things, but I think like any other thing, it becomes a skill. Well, like you said earlier, yeah, it's it's still habitual. Like, okay, so you wanted to stop drinking and yep. you did, but I, I'm I'm guessing you didn't like keep you know bottles of liquor around the house and stuff. You take steps to make it more realistic. It's not it's not gonna be easy, but at the same time, you probably not at least the first month you probably shouldn't be visiting the old friends of the bar. Well, I'll tell you right now, the, the circle of influence changed dramatically overall because of that, right? That kind of thing. Yeah. And and that was probably some of the toughest things to do because, like you said earlier, when you totally take responsibility for what you're doing it's it's like you said it's empowering but it's also very lonely at first right because yeah. it's just you against you right and you have no one to answer to but yourself but how you handle things um and that's i think was one of the big eye openers for me is that i just realized that yeah you know all those things are true but how i'm handling these things were affecting my wife my children my business so i had an even greater responsibility and i think that's what helped pull me through initially was that uh, you know, sometimes we'll do more for others that we care about than we will do for ourselves. And then as things really started to change and improve, then I realized, yeah, this is me against me. And let's just do what it takes to keep that going. Yeah. So if I'm having a rough day, 
find another way to deal with it, right? Rather than what you used to do. And that's sometimes too is filling those voids, right? Because then it creates a void. Now you have to do something else. So maybe it's go to the gym. Maybe it's go for a walk. Maybe it's read a book, right? That kind of thing. And, something, and program, yeah. program the positivity back in. So, I, and I think and that's what I think drew me into the strength training for myself is I grew up on the farm. So when I came okay. to college, I wanted to lose a few pounds and, you know, to get the chicks. So I joined the gym and uh, because of the farm life, I could deadlift like 300 pounds pretty quick and squat two or 300 pounds. But I couldn't fucking bench to save my life. There was nothing to, that I ever did on the farm where you pushed with anything. So I remember being on the bench and there's 75 pounds and the bar's all fucking crooked and I'm all happy with myself. And I'll never forget this. This little French bodybuilder dudes came and sat beside me on the bench, did like 315 for two, went outside and had a smoke. And I remember sitting there going, what the fuck just happened there? I'm the big guy. I'm supposed to be the strong guy. So that's how I got into bench. I'm like, wow, this, I suck at this. And I just decided I was going to do it. And again, being a little bit older than you, you know, I mean, it was muscle and fitness magazines that we could get our hands yeah. on, that kind of stuff. So it was, let's try this, let's try that. And then when Louis Simmons came along, you know, we did a bunch of that stuff and, you know, we're like, all right, let's just do what they do and stuff. And, you know, uh, it, it's just, you know, like you said, there's a, you know, when you have the information, how we process it, what works for us, what works for others, uh, enhance or not enhance, so many different factors. But, you know, back then, I'm like, fuck it, that's what they're doing. That's what I'm going to do. And some things worked well, <laughs> some things mangled us, right? But at least we yep. went out and we learned and we learned. And what do you think now? Because there is so much information available. There's more people benching 400 pounds now than ever. Uh, you yeah. know, 500 is like, yeah, I know, I know 20 guys that do that now. Um, so, but... I find with all that information, there's more progress, but I think also with a lot of that information, there's a lot of things being done wrong at the same time. Oh, that's interesting with the progress, because like we'd have to, the thing we'd have to look at is the numbers. So say there's so many more people involved, you, it's tough to measure the progress because say, say in Canada, there's 10,000 people power, say 20,000 people powerlifting, but yep. in 19, 1995, there was 1,200. Yep. So if you have, you know, five times as many people benching 500 is that progress well not really because there's nine times as many people doing it too just more people so doing better, it. The average is better there. genetic or, pool or are yeah. we more aware of it because of the internet so we're just seeing more people benching this and seeing this. well it feels like the sport itself it. the sport itself you always had like not necessarily the internet but there'd at least be word would get out of yep. like regular regular people it's tough to say because i mean it's clearly the best of the best are a lot better what it is because i mean obviously the training methods have evolved and gotten better but then at the same time there's more bad information too so Absolutely. i wouldn't say the top of the line has certainly gotten better but like i don't re mean i don't remember seeing as much dumb stuff either too so it's kind true, of a eh? tough one true the, the epic gym fails and stuff and this yeah and so that's what's sort of like a challenge now i think is if you want to learn and get better what I advise people who are sort of different than what we're talking about is you go to muscle and fitness trials and stuff is nowadays with so much stuff, you need to kind of focus on one person, learn from that one person, view it as a class. So this, I'm going to learn from Curd, okay? Mm -hmm. Curd's six month or year class, two years, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm going to go to so-and-so and learn. Yeah. Like if you're trying to learn everything versus like, I mean, the other one that do a good way to look at it too besides that is when you are reading like random stuff where you're not totally like focused. I always call it class when you're learning for somebody, but right. you're not in class with this one particular individual is start looking at what all like the, everybody wants to pick about what the, the issues with like Kurd said, you know, you only work your triceps with like, um, you know, heavy compound movements where so-and-so said you only do isolation exercise. Okay. So we got this argument here, right? Why don't we find out what the commonality is that? Well, they both say, we need more triceps. You need to bench press to get better. The bench, yeah. Right. They both say you need more triceps, so we can deduct that. Right. They both say you need to bench press to get better at the bench press, so we can, you know, conclude that everybody's saying that's a great bench presser. You need to bench press to get better at it. So, so at the least common we have denominator, that. the information that we're catching from everyone, right? Right. I learned. I learned that from Charles Poliquin. I don't know if I learned it, but at least he maybe put words behind kind of what I was already doing. Of like, yep. let's look at okay this. Every good bodybuilder eats a lot of protein. So we know you got to eat a lot of protein to build muscles, but you know, how carb timing after training and stuff, that might be a little more debatable where we're going to have to do a little more experimentation and whatnot to figure out for us. But it's smart if you can figure out what the commonalities and universalities are amongst very strong people. 
Right. You know, what's really cool is when you say that, because, you know, typically if you sit down in any sort of bench session with anyone with a decent yeah. bench, they're going to say leg drive. They're going to say break the bar. They're going to say all those things. But the problem I find with a lot of people that are sort of like home classing it off the YouTubes or whatever <laughs> is that they, they hear it, but they have no idea what it really feels like and looks like. So I remember having this conversation with some coaches about five years ago that were really worried about everything coming onto YouTube and like all the secrets. And I remember saying, I said, you know, it's one thing to take the information in, it's how people end up processing it. So you and I could watch the same video on the same technique, but because we're different and with different experiences, we'll both sort of absorb it differently and apply it rather differently. Whereas a coach can turn around and say, okay, I understand the concept you're doing, but you're not quite doing it properly. Let me show you how to get to that. What do you think about that? I totally agree. That's why I like, get the seminar we're going to do up at your gym. It's not going to be, you're not, you're not going to walk away with like an exact 12 week program of how to gain hundred pounds in your total. You're going to be learning concepts and you can, that's why you're there. You get to ask the difference between watching on YouTube or being there is mm -hmm. you get to ask a question and get answered in real time. So, and specific say, to your case, right? Yeah. You can personalize it a bit that way, but you're right. If I said, okay, you start off with high volume, then you go to low volume over time. Well, what the hell does that mean? Does it mean, you know, 50 sets, three sets? I mean, what am I even talking about? That's where the thing is, is our goal is to kind of like, I always say like this, a cook can duplicate a recipe. A chef knows why each ingredients, you know, put in there. Okay. So our goal with the seminar is to make you more of a chef. So you know what's happening and why. And if you say, you know, Hey, you know, if you want to ask me a question, well, I'm going to do, I got to meet in six weeks and I want to taper. I don't really care what the hell the reasoning is, what should I do? I'm happy to answer. Hey, I would guess you do like this, blah, blah, blah. Right, you right. You can take that down, but you're going to be presented like over, you know, concepts and be able to apply them to yourself because, you know, as a lifter, you're evolving. Like you're not, you know, you can change your work capacity, it could change over time. Injuries can change things, how well you recover. Yeah. You know, all that stuff is like, I mean, if you're somebody – that's super explosive and you, you weigh 300 pounds. I mean, you're not going to recover as well as a skinny fat guy that weighs 160 just because you have so much muscle fiber and you have, you can activate firing it so much. You're like at a once. thoroughbred horse. Yeah. yeah. You're firing so much at once. That tissue is so responsive, you know, blah, blah, blah. You're right. just not going to recover as fast as somebody that can't even, you know, flex their chest barely you know it's just different well a lot of times too depending on their experience their overall work you know stress on their body isn't that great because they don't can't produce enough yet right they're still they're, yeah. they're still in that infancy whereas you know and that's one thing i try to teach a lot of the, the the other guys is that you know as you truly get closer to your real strength and technique and all that stuff goes it's actually going to take you longer to recover from meats and from exertion because you're, you're firing at a much higher level you're truly exactly. taxing your capabilities whereas if you're on week three of ever working out you can fucking do all mm -hmm. kinds of shit and you you're, you're never really pushing that limit because you haven't learned how to do that yet yeah no i totally and that's sort of like well, I think sometimes people say, oh, yeah, so-and-so takes steroids. He recovers faster. But it's not always the case because a lot of times you become more efficient and you would think you'd recover faster. But if but all of a sudden – You push so much higher. Yeah, you're zone. pushing so much That's higher. And, like, there's studies that show that it actually increases your muscle pain tolerance. So you're able to push harder. You're activating more motor units, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, if you did three sets of 10 at 225 on bench, you added testosterone – you're going to recover a hell of a lot faster, but you're generally, if you're going to, you know, put in the turbo fuel, you're not going to drive around town. You're going to hit the open highway and hit the gas. And all of a sudden within weeks, if you're able to do 265 for 10 now because of the enhancement, I mean, that's yes. still a stress on the body that a lot of the supporting tissues and things that still haven't caught up yet. And that, you know, is more stressful in the end, I find. It's that's my point is it's not yeah. as simple. None of this is, I'm not trying to say it's good, bad, or yep, it's not a moral it's thing. Just, it's just where it's not an ethical, yeah, it's yeah. just reality of what we're dealing with. If you know, if anyone asks me that question, I always tell them, you know, I, I, I definitely don't recommend it if you're not going for an elite level. I, I also don't recommend anybody do it, but if you're going to do it, let me know, you know, type of thing. Like, I'm not, that's my, I'm not gonna call the cops on you. Yeah. I'm not even going to lecture you, but I do want to know. What's well, a factor in when you're coaching someone? That's what I tell the guys and girls I work with. If you're going to do it, just let me know because I know that I'll have more yeah. information as to what I'm dealing with. It. I go, I, I, say, I tell people all the time, I know all kinds of things about people. I'll never say because that's part of, you know, my reputation is you can talk to me and sure. tell me what's going on. But, you know, first thing is don't lie to me. 
right? And don't try to go amateur when you're pro. Don't cheat. I can't stand that. But other than that. Yeah, I me, totally agree there. Tell me what you're doing. Especially in power. It's one yeah. thing the NFL with $10 million on the line and other people are doing it or something. But I mean, come on, powerlifting, bodybuilding, they got special divisions. You can go either way and, and no one's going to care. Uh, absolutely, right? One of the things I wanted to ask you is because, and just interesting, because someone asked me this uh, when I told him that you were coming in and you were excited. Yeah. And, um, and this guy's a bit of a negative knob, so, but he, he raised a great question, and I wanted to ask you what you thought. He's like, he basically said, well, aren't you worried that people will think you don't know as much because you're bringing in someone who's super knowledgeable? And I'm like, no. I said, because for me, my, I'm not insecure as a coach. I'm going to be learning as well at the yeah. same time, and my job is to continue and learn to improve because as much as I'm working with you guys in our gym, I also want to bench that fucking 600. So I, I want to see yeah. what I can learn and what I can take from someone. And much like you, where you went from place to place to find, learn from the best, you become the best as well, right? Yeah, and that's, that's sort that of like mindset. So we got that divided into two types of mindset. You, have, it's, you need to have, the, um, you need to have a, um, you know, a fixed mindset or growth mindset. So a fixed mindset believes talents dead set. Mm -hmm. You're born good. You're born bad. You're, you're whatever you're yep. athletic, you're smart, you're dumb. Yep. And there's nothing you can do about it. Where a growth mindset you're looking at, you know, you're basically self-made, you know, how you can, you know, what can you going to prove practice is not a negative thing. It's something you have to do to get better. And, um, you know, it, it, you basically embrace challenges. You, you get inspired by people. Mm -hmm. And at the, the same time, it doesn't shy you away from being competitive. It's just, reality of like i mean we all have to learn from people i actually learn from people at these seminars because there's a couple of different things it's like you know people why do you how do you have time to write why do you write why do you do this why do you do that a lot of it's just like um learning myself of like okay like or videos or anything why am i doing this well if i have to like make a video or write an article about this i need to know why i'm doing it very well because mm -hmm. you just have to so that's kind of like how you know you learn that way too so i think you have to well it kind of puts pressure on yourself to keep mastering your craft i think as well yeah in a higher standard have you ever run into that when you because you go to because you go to different gyms a lot this is what you do yeah. have you run into that and you know i'm not asking for specifics but have you walked into a place where the coach is intimidated by your knowledge and it, the whole thing will just have a different vibe than when you walk into a place where you know, like with us, we're like, dude, tell us everything. We want, we're going to pick the fuck out of your brain. Yeah. So I've had a, enough seminars now where you've got a, the luck. Very fortunately, it's been very low percentage of anything like that. Right. But uh, like we, I actually had one, it was Fred Hatfield. Somebody in the, the crowd just was harassing him. Like asking him the dumbest questions too. This guy was like, I, I mean, a personal trainer who's probably, you know, six two, like, 180 with like 30 percent body fat i mean it was right it was, you know and he anywhere. wasn't no, nothing and he kept asking these stupid questions and like but he was doing it in a condescending way that had no relevancy to anything and he was trying to so finally i just jumped in i said so you, what um you know where farmers walk is he said yeah i said well explain it to me and i just started asking him questions back and with the break he left because yeah. he wasn't wanting to learn anything he was trying to overtake it and it was really weird because it was a powerlifting and bodybuilding se seminar. And this guy clearly had a background in neither, like um, himself, obviously, by looking at him, or um, even like knowledge. But it wasn't like he was some book smart scientist that's never done it that knows everything. He didn't know anything. And he had a real negative vibe to him. So I shut it down, like, by. And you know what? And um, it's great that you did. Again, it's, it's part of your character. And while we're on the subject, we were very sad and obviously the, for, for Pet, Fred passing. And we were excited to have this happen last oh, year. Oh, dude, yeah. You know, and, and, and you know Steph, right? He, yeah, of course. He, it broke him. It, he was really, he was so excited. He looks up to you guys so much. And when that happened, I remember he was almost in tears in my office. And I'm like, what, what, I'm like, what the hell happened? And what's going on? And he's worried that I'm going to be upset about the seminar. I'm like, dude, shut the fuck up. It has nothing to do with that. I can see he's upset. I can't believe, you know, this happened to Fred. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to take it all in and stuff. And it was a big thing, man. It was. It was a big thing. And it was, it was, um, that, well, listen to this. So whenever that, whenever, okay. So 
when was your seminar going to be initially? It was going to be July? last June. It was going to be last June. June. I thought yeah. it was July for some reason. Or maybe okay. July. But I think we were trying to do it in June because for us in July and August, it's the, Chris, the summer vacation. And like there's eight people left in town. So we always try to finish it in June or not start it up till September. Okay. So what happened was Fred and I um, were going to Niagara Falls for a seminar, right? So. Yeah. That was on he for, I don't know if he died on Saturday or Sunday. It was either late Saturday. I think it was early Sunday morning because mm -hmm. um, I got a call from his wife like seven in the morning. I knew something was bad because she. Um, I I don't have my phone around the in the morning. I get up really early, but I didn't check it in a couple hours, and I saw there was a voicemail from her, and I kind of knew some. I thought I actually thought I didn't think he was dead. I thought it was. Um, he wasn't feeling good or something. We were gonna have to cancel our trips okay. to Denmark because we had, so we had, the, that was a Sunday. We right. had the seminar in Niagara Falls the following Saturday. So we'd fly out Friday. We we're going to come back home for a couple of days and go to Denmark for 10 days. Oh, wow. And so that was in two, that was within 10 days or something of those, sem of his de death. So she called up and I was like, dang. So it was, it was crazy because she was in, um, no emotional kind of state to deal with this obviously so i i had to like um we did a lot of stuff that i say and but it's on fred's credit card so we had to call me and my wife had to call up all these different um places and get refunds and stuff and but we ever get everything you're dealing with all that emotion but you got the business happening at the same time right yeah that's why we did it though so she wouldn't have to deal yeah. with it but, and i think that's a big thing a lot of people don't understand when you're self-employed as well is that like everybody else, we have um, we we all have personal things that happen to us. But when we have other commitments, those things still have to get done. Yeah, there's no sick days when you're self-employed. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I can only imagine just the stress on all the levels and stuff like that. You know, and uh, yeah, and it was, it was it was really sad because we were like yeah. um, working on some stuff and like you know it was it it, it was like the, honestly though he was like in his seventies mm -hmm. that was like one of the last people I would have expected to. To, to get that phone call about because he had you know that he had cancer in like 2012 they beat it beat it and like if you look at picture look at if you're a chance if you look at his pictures from like right after that right to like 2017 right he looked like even though it was five years later he looked 10 years younger because he'd kind of gotten it he like clearly had gotten his like pep and a step back and was like every time we did a seminar at first he started off not as energetic by the end he was like a ball of fire so his energy level his vitality everything had gone up so that's why it was it was so shocking a bit of a lesson too though right at the same time you know he was doing great stuff right up to the end yeah right and i think that's super important too you know at 50 you know i mean technically i I'm hopefully i'm halfway but at the end of the day you know we had a my 50th birthday was a week ago and people like hey you know the big 50 what are you going to do and, you know, make a big deal. And I said, you know what? Not really, because I spent the last year doing a lot of great things every day. And I'm going to do that every day going forward. So for me, 50 was more of a quiet weekend at home because I, I want to make it so that it's every day that I'm doing what I love and not just one day a year where I try to celebrate yeah. my mediocrity and bullshit and stuff like that. Right. So that's my big one of my big messages. Right. Is every day, man, get shit done, plan events, talk to people, get shit going that you fucking want to do, because you know what? If you don't do it, no one's going to do it for you. Yeah, man. Every day is a gift. So you got to take advantage of having that gift for sure. So talk to me a bit about um, Jailhouse Strong. Like that's, that's your thing. That's your concept. I know you have a book or two on that. I, I, I was, you've got like 700. There we go. Right here. There you go. <laughs> that's one of the 700 books I think you've got going. Was yeah. that your first book? No. My first book was Metroflex Gym Power Building Basics. Okay. So is that more of like a manual instructional encyclopedia thing? It's, it's, yeah, kind of, it's, it's a lot of, um, it starts off kind of the history of Metroflex gym. Um, which, and then it goes into kind of like, um, you know, why you're doing things like that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. some stuff on nutrition mm -hmm. and then, um, goes into a ton of workouts. I mean, there's, that was kind of like the difference between that and a lot of other books that were out there. Cause a lot of other books would be more like, you know, here's the like, you know, five, three, one, here's what five, three, one is blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. This was like, here is tons of programs, but every single one of them had been, um, 
none of them were written for the book. It was like all battle tested stuff. So this is just like you strung along a bunch of the great workouts you've done and you've worked with yes. clients on. Like this is like, here's a, here's an operations manual. A lot of them was copy and pasted directly off of Excel sheets and stuff. So it was it. totally real. So then um, Jell House Strong, or no, next book I did was right around Jell House Strong time. It was um, Bench Press of Science. Yes, I have that book. And that's the okay. one we're telling everyone. That's the one we're doing. Yeah. And that's um, for, for the seminar and, and stuff and people that are kind of students of the game, that would probably be the best one. Okay. And um, that that's on the side. That's basically like, okay, you know, like um, what I did is like, okay, compensatory acceleration training. You know, I, I know it works, blah, blah, blah. But then I actually would go in there and cite studies that I found that backed it too. So I would just, you know, initially write what I thought about it, then try to find scientific information to back it or, or not back it. Say, Hey, you know what? Even though studies don't agree with this, it's been working. So here's why, but it's you, funny, you know, it's funny you say that. Cause I was just reading some of it and I, I'm a big believer in speed. Um, you know, explosivity off the chest tightness, so important. Uh, and I love chains and I really, I just read your, your, your section on where you did the study, the, the study was done on benching with and without chains Yeah, uh, and why, you know, it was easier on the shoulders because there wasn't the load at the beginning, but yet they still ended up roughly around the same increases, but just with less trauma to the delts and stuff. So I found that super, you know, and it was and like, another was, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And it, it forced people to compensatory accelerate the weight. Like, so that's why a lot of people would say like, Oh yeah, beginners can never use chains. Well, the thing is the chains taught the beginners, like those baseball players that were, um, you know, no lifting experience, how to compensatory accelerate the weight because all of a sudden you got chains on the bar. Yeah. You and have it's to. forcing you have to, or yeah. it's going to come right back down on you. Yeah. You know, I think that's, I think one of the biggest things that I find when I'm trying to teach specifically um, with lifters is the concept of tightness. And if you can't acquire mm -hmm. tightness, then you can't be explosive. It just doesn't work. And I find the bench has been one of the easiest tools to teach that so that it carries over to their deadlift and to their squat sure. and stuff. Because we, we sell, we, and there's a couple of P's of mine. Every coach yells tight, every coach yells fast, but no one teaches or very few teach what tight feels like and what fast feels like. So one of the things I do when I do my bench seminars is I actually get the clients on the bench, get them to do their normal setup. Then I'll start jacking them into place and pushing their traps back and getting their heels to create that tightness. And I'm like, that's what tightness actually feels like. So they now yeah, I'm the same way when I do the practical is like, um, so um, I kind of learned this from doing some seminars at Ed Cohn. We just go in there and this works really well. It's just, sorry, we're in a bench now, start benching not say anything, then boom, just come over to somebody and you got to do this and this and this type of thing versus like, well, I'm going to show you how to bench and well, listen up. I kind of like, cause you got to, like you're saying, they got to feel it and you can adjust it within, cause everybody's a little different. You got to adjust it to what's going to work for them. It's, it's yeah. actually really funny because a lot of what you're saying is, is exactly, you and I think a lot alike on, on a lot of these concepts. So it's really cool. So yeah. I'm even more excited to spend time with you and, 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 and see how you teach it and how you approach it and stuff like that. And, you know, it, sure. I don't believe in searching out people that agree with me for sure, because that's not how you learn. But it's kind of cool and, and kind of self-actualizing for myself to realize that, hey, one of the greats out there also thinks this way. And I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm on to something. I just don't always have the sure. big words to explain it and stuff. I've always said that about myself, right? Um, I want to go back to something and, uh, that you talked about. And it's one of my peeves is the 531. Okay. Right? Um, and this is just what I think. And, and let me know what you think on it yep. is... I think when uh, Wendler came up with it, I think he came up with it for a really good reason as a season lifter that needed to give his body a break and recover and stuff. But the, I have a hard time when I see guys and girls that have, have, that's their first program they roll with and stuff. And I'm like, that really wasn't what 531 was about. It was really about, you know, trying to help your body heal from so much work and still maintain some lifting. What do you think about that? It's so, or sort of, it was also a response to, um, and rightfully so, as things have gotten like, you know, super complicated where people weren't like you're saying. So it's kind of like a simple, sort of like, um, do you know Brooks Cubic's book, Dinosaur yes. Training? Yep. Same type of thing is it was a bit extreme, but it was a warranted response of like in the 90s where everybody was just kind of like, I don't even know what you call it. Like, you know, kind of crypto bodybuilding training that didn't really, but not even hard bodybuilding training, like joke bodybuilding training where everything's seated on a machine, easier, you know, that type of thing. The isolation from, movement. Yeah, isolation, comb palace movements, and, like, you know, not even hard ones either. Like, you know, 
like squats and gone the way to lay these cinches, that kind of thing. Yep. Yep. Where five, three, one was the same type of thing. I think it's like, you know, everybody's talking about like these Russian programs and conjugate this and that. And then like a lot of people in the process had, had gotten and their, you know, their eyes so brilliant, they weren't even getting stronger. And the five, three, one brought it back to the most simple kind so of progression. Me. Because if you look at the five, three, one, it's very similar to um, bigger, faster, stronger. Yep. From the nine. So same type of things, you know, rep schemes, like instead of five, three, one, they had five, four, three, two, one stuff. So, yeah, I think um, it's obviously like you're saying it'll be a, a bit more to it than that, but right. um, it did serve a very good purpose because things had gotten so complicated, it made them much simpler. Like a pause, so sort of take a pause in your looking. Yeah. At your yeah. Okay. All right. So it's sort of like, you know, a lot of times, you know, you need to like do stuff like that where you have to like take a pause and. Yep sort of need like an extreme reaction to what's extreme the wrong way. Well, you know what? And, and I, now when you put it that way, I do like that as well. Um, you know, I, and we, I hear it a lot of times I get guys in the gym that'll, you know, I'm doing candido and I'm doing this and I'm doing, I'm squatting every day. And I'm like, well, have fun with that, you know, because that's going yeah. to work for a few weeks and then you're going to mangle, right. That kind of stuff. Hey. Yeah. So that's the thing is like, that was a thing. Another one, that's a great example of squat every day. So that, I think a lot that got popular because a lot of people were starting to back so far off frequency where, you know, I squat, you know, once a month type of thing. So, okay, once a month's not enough. So let's do it every day. Like it just becomes one extreme to another. So the needle goes too far to one side. Yeah. So like a lot of people get so attached to ideologies, they don't figure out what's going to work good. Cause like, I mean, squat every day. Like why, why were most people doing it? Well, a lot of people were doing it to put it on Instagram. They could like hashtag squat every day. It was yes. not like, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, I mean, one of the people, I don't remember who it was, but somebody on bodybuilding.com had, it was a big name too, was like talking about how they're squatting every day for a year and their squat had gone up like 40 pounds. It wasn't very much. It wasn't a high squat to start with either. Yeah. But it was like, they didn't even mention their bench or deadlift and that's the problem. So let's say squatting every day does work better for your squat. Okay. What does it do then for your deadlift? You know, my big concern all the time when I look at people that go overdo it on one thing is I try to explain to them that, you know, for me, there's one nervous system. And when that nervous yeah. system gets fried, it doesn't give a fuck if it's from squatting or deadlifting or the fact that you're, you're about to lose the house from stress, right? That, that nervous system fries, everything suffers and stuff. And that's my concern when I see the squat every day and stuff. And, you know, if you have a shitty squat and you put 40 pounds on it after a year of training, I don't think that's a great program either. Yeah, I, it, what, yeah so the point is it was sort of scary that they were promoting this. It's like, I mean, I'm sure there's people that have gained a lot more from that program than they could have. But the point being is like it, it, the, the issue I've seen with a lot of people that do squat specialization program type of programs like that is they don't go up in the other lifts, especially because like Fred used to talk about how his rotator cuff surgery in his mind was from squatting more than benching, like holding that low bar position and whatnot. Okay. So, I mean, if like a lot of people, a lot of lifters, especially like masters lifters, um, they don't feel good necessarily next to their shoulders after they squat. So if you started introducing, like, let's not even forget about the central nervous system. Just talk about your shoulders. The joints and the, yeah. The joints, are they going to feel good squatting every day? I mean, even if it's not your knees or your hips, are your shoulders going to feel good every day? Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, the, right. it's just a thing of like, um, you know, like in, in like other sports, people talk about, oh, yeah, that picture of shoulder surgery, overuse. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. So. But squatting every day won't produce overuse. <laughs> overuse is overuse, right? Repetitive yeah, yeah. it's the same thing overall. What um so now and also so you've got books. What's your favorite books? You got Jailhouse Strong, you've got the Metroflex, you've got uh Bench the Science. What's your favorite book? When you look back at all the shit you you've written and all that information, what's the one that you're like, that's the book? Or has that happened yet? Um though so far. Um, my favorite would be, um, I'd say uh, probably, um, ah, it's, there are they're probably four of them, the jailhouse strong and successful mindset one, cause that's all mindset. Yeah. So they're each unique in, uh, Metroflex in the sense of just because that was the first one and it, it was very unique in like the way it was written. Um, bench press of science, because I was just sort of like, okay. Um, I had been getting so many questions and I kind of wanted to lay down some answers and it gave a good opportunity to do that specifically for the bench press. But with that book, you could replace deadlift with bench press and pretty much come away with a, 
obviously like the supporting, you know, tricep stuff wouldn't apply, but like right. isometrics, things like that. Right. Could you could just, you could just, you know, do a word document where you change bench press to deadlift and the same thing would hold true. Right. Um, okay. So that, and then gel how strong was probably like, um, the most fun to write, like just, um, tracking down random hooligans to interview and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Like cool. an interesting, fun experience. I love it, man. I love it. What, um, so ISSA, you're, you're, you're high up in that. Is that something that you're still ongoing with? Is that the certification yeah, so that kind of stuff? It's a certification for personal trainers. So, um, I'm like, a, um, I'm the director of applied strength and power. And so that's not like I'm not employed by ISSA. I'm like privately contracted. So, um, what it like, um, so I just came out with, for them, a bodybuilding course, um, and, um, it's, it's on, um, it's on, it's sort of like, I'd call it more. It's the only thing it's lacking. It's not so much like for the contest prep bodybuilding, like of how to like deplete water to the last three right. days type of thing. Right. I would say a better name. It would say it's almost more like functional hypertrophy. Okay. So the science of building muscle. Science of building muscle, building a symmetrical physique, that type of thing versus right. like the 10 weeks before know, prep or whatever. Exactly. And then, um, Looking at another one with them is a strength course, which is kind of in the works. So I don't know what we're going to do with that. It's kind of like not my call at this point. Right, right. Um, and um, yeah, it's been good. I mean, it's um, that's kind of the organization I've, uh, I, or it is the organization I started with at 19 years old. Okay. And kind of gone since then. And then, um, so I knew like all everything Fred had ever written before we'd even met. So yeah, it, so it worked out. Really, really cool well. to, to see an organization that you started following and became a part of. Now you're an integral part of. That's good. Yeah, I mean, it, I like their their vision, and I agree with all. You know, what the thing I think that they do a really good job of is like, you know, somebody might say, "Oh, the the test is open book. That's too easy." Blah blah blah. But what they're not saying the whole truth is, if you're in SCA, take a test. All you do is show up, you take a test. So that proves you're able to pass the test, which is great. But right. the ISSA, you have to, um, it's more real life because you're going to have to, des- they do case studies. So you might have to design a 12 week program for the CFT, the certified fitness trainer on, you know, a 40 year old that enjoys tennis. Blah, blah. What are you going to do for that program for 12 weeks? That, and if that happens in real life, you do have a textbook for that. So yeah, you're going to have a resource manual for you. to. It's a resource program, manual. Right? So, but it's saying, I feel it prepares people better because it prepares you better because you're doing what you're actually do is design these programs and things like that. Like, no, I mean, in all my years of training, I, I think like twice in 18 years, somebody's asked me if I'm certified. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've never, yeah. I don't get people saying like, you know, what's, you know, how's the endocrine resp- response to, you know, this, it doesn't really happen like that. So, you know, so those test questions are good. To, I think they're good in the sense to know that you know what you're talking about, but like they don't actually prepare you to train people where I feel like ISSA actually does. And then they have like customer support where people actually call if we get help. So that's kind of why, I mean, uh, why I've stayed with them is and, and believe in their vision. Sounds like they, they work on bridging the gap between the book science, the knowledge and the application to the end user, right? So I, 100%, I think- they'll even send me questions about like, somebody's a bodybuilding course question they'll like you know write me hey so and so wanting to know this and stuff like the head of the organization will so right they're pretty they're on top of things well and i think what's really important too is that you know i've taken basic courses i took you know pure and applied science in college math physics biology yeah uh, chemistry so i understand the fundamentals i've taken some certifications but there's a lot to be said also for just the 25 plus years in the trenches competing myself and doing my stuff and just really caring about helping individuals. I get asked every once in a while, Hey, you know, what's your certification? And I'm like, Oh, I did FMS a while ago and you know, that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, I think there's also a part of it where you master your, your craft. It just, it, it shows and how you deliver and the success. And that's what I, I think I gelled so well. Fred went on was like, it was like, um, okay, great. Let's, we figured out what's work. We can figure out why later, you know, that's kind yeah. of what I at Charles Pollock one too, is like yeah. guys that figure out what works. Yeah, and then all of a backwards. sudden, you know, 30 years later, you know, science confirms it. Well, you know, science didn't have to do a study when, you know, 
you're producing superior results. But. Well, or why wait? Why sometimes wait for that? You know, that for someone else to yeah. when you know it's working, it's working because you've done it yourself. You've done it repeatedly with clients. Like there's, there's, there's that anecdotal is, is that's there. It's real and stuff. If, you know, albeit if you really care about what you do, as far as, you know, getting results for people and, and not hurting and stuff like that. I think that goes without saying in anything we do overall. So, um, What's it like for you now, you know, do you compete anymore? Uh, what's training like for you? Like, what's, what's that all about for you? I don't compete anymore. Okay. So training for me is uh, more about staying conditioned and things like that. I'm a lot lighter than when I competed. You know, okay. I'm probably, you know, 50 pounds lighter. So um, staying in good condition, um, being able to do various different activities while not sacrificing my strength in the process. Okay. That type of thing. So like, for instance, yesterday, um, I did, I did sprints in the sand, um, at a volleyball court, you know, today train some chest and back. So, I mean, I do, I still do. I still basically the way I explain to people, I train as hard as ever. I just don't put the mental energy into what I used to meaning with set up like, I'm going to like go train in my garage. So what mm -hmm. I'll do is I got a book out there written down what I've done before. I'm going to do this same type of workout at least. So I know if I'm doing flies on my cable machine, I'm going to beat here what I did before type of thing versus like before when I had to squat 900 in training, mm -hmm. um, that was all I thought about. So, I mean, I was kind of obsessing about it. Like I, I wouldn't have really had the success with others at that point, just because I, I couldn't have put the in, mental energy into this. Well, you kind of have to, was, to, to, to be at that level in any endeavor, you yeah. can't have to put that effort. So I get asked a lot why I never competed in the deadlift and the squat. And I said, point blank, quite honestly, I don't love those lifts as much as I love the bench to never miss a bench workout and to put my body through the, the beat up of the benching. Now I squat kettlebells and body weight, you know, for functional stuff. Yeah. And I de I'm deadlifting more now because guys are always bugging about it. So I'm, I want to tell the guys, I'm gonna, I want to build a 600-pound double overhand grip deadlift just so I can say I did it. So I'm at about 480. Yeah. So I do it. But it gets me deadlifting once a week, right, which is good for me overall. Right. But to me, bench is the thing that I, give, I care the most about. It's the one I'll put the extra effort and focus on when it's time to get ready for a meet. And I still have – you know, 500 was a goal, 550, now 600 is that goal. And, and to me, that goal is going to get done. I'd like, I, I hope that I was going to get it done it's in December. It didn't go as well. Um, but 2018, I want to come out of it with that 600 pound bench. And, you know, whether I do it at 50 or I did it at 45 or 35, it's still 600. There's still not a lot of guys that do that. But at the end of the day, it also That's absolutely, doesn't matter how, what your age is. Exactly. And to me, at the same token, it's what makes me show up every Tuesday night to bench and every Saturday afternoon to lunch is that 600 is always in the back of my mind. Even if I'm not in a competitive strain for it right now, I'm still in there mm -hmm. benching. I'm buffalo barring now. It's my new thing. I fell in love with a buffalo bar. And, you know, so I'm just rocking that shit and sore all over. And it's nice. And it's nice break about not having to go to always go to the heavies and stuff to give your, your nervous system a bit of a break. And you know what? Now I'm working, I'm, you know, I'm 350. I want to get down to 300. So today I did rowing and cardio, you know, for 20 minutes. So I'm throwing some of that other stuff in. But at the end of the day, in the back of my mind is like, I'm going to bench that fucking 600. That Josh Bryant seminar we're going to do is going to get me there. And that's what, you know, that's how we fire it all up, right? That's, that's still the 18-year-old that's in me. Right, absolutely. You know, that kind of thing. Um, so how about balance? And this is something that's important when I talk about just for the people that listen to the podcast, balancing business, training, fatherhood, being a family man. What's that like? What's, what's, what's the hard part about the balance? What's the easy part about the balance for you? Um, not being super balanced. So. <laughs> <laughs> the lack of balance. <laughs> the lack of balance. So just, um, you know, besides like my family and training and stuff, I don't, you know, I have close friends, but I don't go out like socializing and stuff probably as most as mo mo most people would. Right. Right. So, and you're, you're, you have a young family. I remember that, you telling me they're, they're, yeah, my kids are five and three. So, yeah. So they're still cute and cuddly. My 17 year old son just walked in and stuff. And we're at that love hate relationship because he's 17. He's a great kid, but you know, he's 17, yeah. right? Give me the car keys and I need some gas and I'll see you later. You know, that kind of thing. So, <laughs> and my daughter's 15. And like I always say, she can live here till she's 40. He has to get out of here by the time he's 19. You know, it's a double. Gotcha. Standard. But they're both great kids. They play sports. Uh, they've been in the gym with me since they're five and six. So they can swing a kettlebell. They can deadlift. They can bench. They're quite impressive because we worked on the fundamentals. And that's always been important for us overall. And uh, I, my son deadlifted at a – we have a CPF meet uh, federation out here, which is part of the WPC. 
Okay. The Canadian Powerlifting Federation is the one we're a big part of. We've done RPS, CPF. Uh, I used to compete in the uh, the CPU, the Canadian arm of the IPF. Yeah, the USAPL. Yeah, Canadian, the un yeah. we call it the Unfun League. Uh, I, I competed yeah, there yeah, for, for sure. 20 years in the amateur and stuff. But CPF and RPS I like because a little more fun. Uh, we run meets. Uh, we run through yeah, it's political meets. Too. I love it. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're strict but fair, as we like to say, in our judging. But at the end of the day, my son competed in his first deadlift only uh, last year. And I remember when he's doing it, I'm like, I'm in tears on the side watching him do something. You That's know, that awesome. Kind of thing. So it's pretty cool to have that, you know, it's, it's not always about work. It's not always about I, I think the stuff. main thing, honestly, just joking aside, is what I've found to be the biggest thing is cut out non-essentials. So, like, you just don't, like, waste time you yeah. just have to figure out what's important and do it so i'm gonna make sure i do something with my kids every single day you know it might be you know whatever it could be you know like we where we live we got lakes all around we take them fishing all the time like stuff like that i just don't cut out stuff that's not essential and practical in how i use my time like for instance i could i got a pretty big yard i could cut the grass but i don't because i can make more money than i would save by just working you know so it. it's yeah. sort of like you could be like, Oh, I'm going to do it all myself. You could, but I'm going to, I would technically be losing money and time with my kids to prove a point. Well, especially when you get to a certain point where you're, you have a skill and you're, you're established where you, you're right per hour in doing your, your craft makes you more money so that yeah. you can turn around and afford to hire that guy to mow the lawn for you. Exactly. That's, time. that's how I roll. Or spend it with your family, whatever you deem to be much more valuable. If shit hit the bed and you couldn't afford it, I know you'd mow your own lawn. I'm mowing right. on a lawn, absolutely. But and then, it's not um, the wisest use of our energy. It's not the wisest use of your energy. So that that's the, that's the main way how I balance is just figure out what's not essential. Then you know what I don't need to, what I can hire somebody to do if, um, and then does it make financial sense? Like obviously, um, a lot of that stuff is going to make way more sense to farm it out versus because I I know some people that sort of talk to him about this before about that like very 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 well off people mm -hmm. that insist like one guy insists on doing his yard work but he doesn't sometimes recover from the workouts but he's you know running a big medical practice and stuff on top of it so like there's no re i said dude it doesn't make sense for you to mow your lawn you'd be better off just how long does it take you two hours okay you'd be better off just spending two hours at a job a week if that's that important to you and you could right. hire somebody and have a lot more money in your pocket or spend that time doing something to benefit himself more like his health. So training, yeah. working, unless it's mowing that lawn is his Zen thing that he does. And that's his, you know, if he's doing it that way, I, I can understand it. It might not be the way I Zen out or the way you Zen out, you know, and that's important. But at the end of the day, if he's just doing it, cause you know, no matter how much he makes, he's just too cheap to pay someone. It's, it's that's what, it, you know what I mean? Well, the way he, the reason I kind of read into it was the way he was talking about it was seemed like it was like, just somebody felt like he had to do like, cause I think, you know, when you start off, like, I mean, I, you know, I was living in some dump apartment 10 years ago. There's yeah. no way in hell I could have got, I didn't have a lawn to, it wasn't like it was even an issue. I had no lawn to mow. That's I mean, right. I was just hoping to not get shot when I walked in out of the comp. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you lived in a great place. I love it, buddy. I love it. And you were a big yeah. dude. So you were a big target. That's um, right. Yeah. So like I say, like it's, it wasn't a factor, but you have to like look at where what your present situation is, and 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 do it. Whereas like um, if you're getting your lawn mowed to prove that you're a high roller and you can't afford it, that's stupid too. You know. It's funny you say that because one of the uh, podcast episodes we're about to I'm about to record later on talks about the reason why we do things, right? So if, if we sit there and we build a great physique because we care about our body and it's important to us, that's a great reason to do it. If we build that same physique and we do it just to show up the other guys in the gym, it's the terrible reason to do it, right? So it's yeah, because really eventually reason. you're going to be like all messed up in the head. Yeah. Well, it's just you know because you're you're not you're not doing it for the right reasons. You know when you talk to someone in the gym, you can tell within minutes this guy is going to train for the rest of his life, and then you can tell within minutes that this guy is going to be here for six weeks. He'll have done a cycle, and we'll never see him again. Hey, you're exactly right about that. Like they just don't. Yeah, I mean. Like who you can tell who'd be like, okay, if the rest of the population got wiped out and you're here alone, would you still be training? You know, exactly. exactly. A lot of and people that's a wouldn't, a lot of people wouldn't. Determine how we're going to spend our energy with people as well. I find if I think you really give a shit and it matters to you, I'll help you out. 
right? And yeah. A lot of times I'll give you more than I'm charging you for whatever, because I see of course. you do something with it. Whereas if you come in and you're Joe douchebag and stuff like that, I'm like, I'm going to charge you more because I have to put up with you and stuff like that. Right. Or, <laughs> or all of a sudden I'm just too busy because I got to go mow my lawn because I'd rather do that than deal with that. You know, that kind of thing. I really, my last year has really been about how, like you said, how I spend my time has become super valuable because that's our biggest uh, asset and our most valuable asset. Is yeah. Time. That's how I am too. I don't, I don't, I screen people ahead of time before we're going to start just because it's just not, you know, I, I'd rather just, you know, live in the apartment complex. I guess I wouldn't now with kids, but if it's yeah, single, yeah. I'd certainly rather live in the shot out apartment complex than deal with people that are bad. Well, for sure. Right. And here's the other thing too, right. Is that at the end of the day, we realize that, you know, if we determine how we spend our time and we take control of that, we spend it more wisely. Absolutely. So that, that's, I think that's the biggest thing with balance and stuff is like you're saying, just kind of at the end of the day, take inventory of what's essential yep. and what's not. If you're, if you're surfing the web for two hours, I mean, do you need to be doing that? Well, maybe, cause maybe you're actually trying to learn something and you're succeeding, but a good, you know, if you're checking out the Facebook of somebody you don't like, cause you're hoping their car is crappier than yours. That's a waste <laughs> of time. And that's destroying yourself mentally. Huge. I love it. I, I laugh yeah. because I see people do it. Those are the same people that, you know, you can put a post out and you know, 99% of the posts I ever put out on Facebook are super positive. Yeah. We're up to some people, you know, just congratulating people just, and when I see people post stuff, I'm like, I like, if I like it, I like it. I won't sit there and crap on a shitty post. You know, I see guys doing horrible form. I'm not that guy that's like, Oh, you're this and this, and this, if you ask me, I'll tell you. But I'm not. Yeah, if you well, that's the thing. If you really cared, yeah. If somebody really cared, they they would just private. Me if someone saw that and yeah. cared, they'd send a person a private message like, "Hey, you know what? Yeah. When you squat that way, you're not tied at the bottom, and you hurt your back eventually. Here's what you need to do. Absolutely. If you cared, not just post under it. Your your spine's about to you know you know be on the seventh level of hell when you yeah. break your back because <laughs> you're not getting tight. Blah blah blah. You know you don't really care at that point. You're just yeah pontificating to make yourself. Feel, feel you're a basically better, yeah. Better, yeah. Yeah, I hear you. It's really cool. I, I, I really like the vibe. I really like where you're coming from. I think we're going to have a great day uh, on I June know we will. 15th. I think we're going to learn a lot, um, and it's going to be a blast and stuff. So I want to thank you for this, Josh. Is there anything you want to uh, end with? Is the best way to contact well, well, you or anything like that? Yeah, the best way to contact you is from my website, joshstrength.com. Um, and so if you're interested in what I'm doing here, I got YouTube's at Jailhouse Strong. Okay. And then the Instagram's at Jill House Strong too. Facebook's Josh Strength Method. So that's kind of you see is like sort of like, um, you know, what I'm doing and things. If, if just go back and look at the videos, say, okay, you know, this is who he's working with, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And you can see if, you know, you like what you're seeing, come to the seminar. If you think I'm crazy, don't come. But I yeah. think you'll like what you're seeing. And um, the seminar is going to, there'll be definitely structure to it. Good. But if you guys have a lot of questions and, you know, I don't have a problem with it morphing into a lot of Q and A too, whatever. I'm going to have a plan to talk for four hours. If we don't get through it all, because you have specific questions, that's fine too. Cause this is about you guys getting the most out of it. And it's just another reason to bring you back. If we don't get through it all. I mean, I'm a big believer in that kind of stuff yeah. as well. Uh, all that information you just gave us is going to be in the show notes. So we're going to have that in there and all hyperlinks so people can just click and go. It's going to be, I, I, I really, this was great. This is my favorite way to have a, an interview. Just, two guys talking about shit we love to do and, and just yeah. here's what's working for me. Here's what's not working for me. Cause I find that's where people learn the most rather than just throwing data out there and stuff like that. It's, I think most of us learn conversationally at first and then we can ask specific questions and stuff. And sure. what I really like about this is we get a chance just to, just to get to know you a little bit. It makes people more comfortable when they're at the seminar to feel like they know you a little more. And it's always easier to have a conversation with someone you, you know, like, and trust than sit there and be all like intimidated or shy or whatever and stuff. So we're going to use this, um, this interview as a way to, as a recommendation say, Hey, anyone who's coming to the seminar, watch this because get to know Josh a bit more so you can Absolutely. ask better questions and, and feel more comfortable doing it. That's yep. it. And there'll be no holding back at the seminar or anything I got to an answer for. I'll give it to you. I if I it. don't know the answer, I'll be straightforward with you. You know what? And it's the best way to handle it and stuff like that. You know, there's nothing wrong with saying, I'll get back to you on that. Right. I like uh, every once in a while, I'll tell someone they're fucking crazy too. I find that helps. But at the end <laughs> of the day, you know, I mean, it's, ju we're just sharing the, um, the benefit of your experience and stuff. You know, you're, you're coaching some fucking strong guys. We're definitely, you know, yeah. into that kind of stuff. And uh, at the end of the day, I, I honestly think if someone's in the strength game, either as a coach or as a, as a, an enthusiast of strength themselves, they'd be foolish not to be at this event. That simple. Won't argue that.
All right, my brother. We'll talk to you later. All Thank right. you very much, Josh. Thanks, Kurt. All right, my man. All right. Have a good one. Bye. Okay.